The AMD Radeon GPUs get a major boost up to 55% in OpenGL graphics performance with the soon to launch Windows 11 22H2 driver. Now from the mining perspective, it's important to note that you probably won't see any performance increase here because it is not running off of the lower level API for OpenGL or at least any of the miners are. So this is really just a testament to what's happening in the GPU market though. And it's important to pay attention to because the problem that AMD has always had is had their driver driver issues as well as issues with just in general, of course, getting utilized by game developers with all their features and so on and so forth. So what this means is that we are starting to see a shift in the market to where AMD is really Radeon's really catching up to GeForce and NVIDIA. And I think it's important to note so that we're kind of aware of how these markets are going to function, especially with new GPU launches. After giving a major performance boost in the DirectX 11 API, AMD seems to be gearing up to deliver a similar boost to OpenGL applications with the upcoming Windows 11 22H2 GPU driver aimed at Radeon Graphics Solutions. Last month, AMD released a driver which focused on improving DirectX 11 performance in a range of titles that utilize the API. AMD stated up to 30% performance gains for Radeon GPUs, and we saw similar results within independent tests. Now the company is planning to switch gears and focus on the OpenGL side of things. Both DirectX 11 and OpenGL are still very commonly used in various benchmark applications and certain legacy games, and users who want the best performance may look for competitor graphics cards if AMD can't deliver the same level of graphics performance in their favorite titles. As such, it looks like AMD has devised its plans to release a new driver in the Windows 11 22H2 build that will offer a significant boost in OpenGL performance. Guru3D's former or forum member, the creator, managed to receive the Windows update in or received the update in Windows 11 and was able to confirm that it is indeed a new driver from the GPU-Z WDDM information tab. The user also managed to run a few performance benchmarks, which shows a 55% gain in UnEngine Valley benchmark, which is now compar uh, comparable to DirectX 11. In UnEngine super Superposition, the Radeon GPUs will be getting a 34% performance boost, which is around 20% slower than DirectX 11, but not the massive 52% difference that was seen on previous drivers. In the UnEngine ben benchmark, the drivers delivered the opposite results, with the new drivers witnessing a a 26% reduction in GPU performance. As you can see here, you got benchmark 1.0, 1.0, and where does it list? I, I guess it doesn't really list the driver here, but you can see 66, 79. Okay, that's for Windows 8, right? So I guess they went back to Windows, or Windows 8 just was, okay. I think it's 66, 79 versus 64, 69 before the driver. In UnEngine, you had a score, wow, look at that FPS difference, 106 frames per second to 183 frames per second on UnEngine. What about superposition, superposition from 15762 to 17642? While the performance boost is there, it looks like we'll see some sort of regression in a few OpenGL titles with the new Radeon GPU drivers. AMD may still need to optimize its drivers for really old benchmark applications and game titles, but this is a good start for AMD to refocus on OpenGL optimizations. Now, we've known that, of course, AMD and Radeon has been pretty good at Vulkan, which is basically just the... Uh, I guess the predecessor, for lack of a better term, of OpenGL. And it's done pretty well in DirectX 12 as far as rasterization goes. And that is compared to, of course, NVIDIA. But one of the arguments that a lot of people get with NVIDIA versus Radeon is, is of course, the NVIDIA drivers just seem to work, right? It just works. It's like something that was used in a lot of marketing material for some time as well against Radeon. And that's because that you do run into the most odd issues when you're utilizing a Radeon GPU on a day-to-day -day basis. It's gotten a lot better, of course, since the 5000 series or definitely since Polaris, where it was just absolutely awful. Weird things like Premiere just not even showing the video while you're trying to edit, uh, random artifacting in games without actual having any 
hardware failure going on, tons of random stuff like that. So AMD and Radeon have done a great job at catching up on that front. But as you can see, even in the last line here, they still need to probably optimize some of its drivers for the really old benchmark applications. I'm sure it'll get there all that sort of thing, but it is going in the right direction. And I really do think Radeon for the 7000 series is going to give uh, NVIDIA a pretty big kick in the pants, right? Because what we've seen, and especially on the mining front, it's very relevant, is that we're seeing the best performance per watt out of the 7000 series leaks that we've ever seen. While on the AMD green team side, we're just seeing a huge increase in power for a, you know, an increase in a subsequent increase in the performance. And whenever this starts happening, this is when you start to see the flip start to happen in the market towards whatever product that is. An example would be, of course, Ryzen versus Intel or the release of Ryzen from AMD versus Intel. And it got worse and worse as they got the chiplet designs and all that sort of stuff. And you saw that kind of flip happen with AMD and Intel. Now they're still competing. Intel has plenty of money to to redo their R&D. They added in those performance cores. Things are kind of really hot in that market. What we want to see, of course, is that same thing happening in the GPU market. And I think we're gonna be lucky enough to see that. And I'm excited for it because at the end of the day, this channel started out as a tech channel, right? And I'm still interested in tech. It's not like that goes away. So I do cover that stuff. Uh, especially as it pertains to gaming performance. And if you're into gaming, you can follow me over on twitch.tv slash blind run. We've been playing the cycle frontier lately. You're welcome to hop in a few rounds of that as well. It's basically like uh, escape from Tarkov light. It's very fun, but let's get into this next one. You guys need to be aware of this AMD and Intel attacked by the Hertz bleed CPU vulnerability that unlocks cryptographic keys through boost clocks. So, this one's really, really interesting, and I'm wondering if it just means we turn off boost clocks, right? And, but Intel and scientists from UT Austin, UIUC, and UW distributed papers today framing the Hertz bleed chip weakness that permits side channel assaults to take secret AES cryptographic keys by noticing the CPU's boost frequency levels and power instruments. As per outside scientists and researchers, both Intel and AMD CPUs are under attack. However, AMD is not given a warning yet. The weakness doesn't influence all cryptographic code, yet some moderation strategies for affected frameworks accompany, at this point, vague execution punishments. Intel says it has found this weakness through interior security examinations, yet outside research groups later uncovered their discoveries to the organization. The presently composed revelation carries the issue uh, into the public eye. Be that as it may, reasonable CPUs from different merchants are additionally influenced. A Hertz bleed based assault takes information by taking advantage of an optional impact of a procedure on a system. And for this situation, watching the power signature of some random cryptographic workload. Likewise, with most system workloads, the signature left by a cryptographic workload changes because the processor's dynamic boost clock frequency changes during the processing. Now, I don't know that this is a way to get around it, but it sure seems like it. If you are a custom PC builder or you are just like, you know, you build your own PCs, you're familiar with overclocking and such, it may be reason to just go ahead and get into your BIOS and lock your CPU core and get rid of dynamic boost. Um, I don't know that that solves it for sure, but it's kind of an interesting line of thought that I'm having during this. An assailant can shift that power data completely to timing information, permitting them to take cryptographic keys. Cryptographic executions previously solidified against power side channel assaults aren't helpless to the Hertz bleed weakness. The Hertz bleed CPU vulnerability is currently affecting both AMD and Intel processors. Interestingly, it only affects Zen 2 and Zen 3 architecture and is unknown if the same exploit will appear in upcoming Zen 4 processors. Interestingly to me, that means that Zen 1 is left out of this, which is quite interesting because of the way the boost worked with Zen 1, right? Which wasn't very widespread. Um, it's kind of cool. 
it, it, obviously it's not good, but it's kind of cool, right? <laughs> this is how this is functioning. Hertzbleed can take advantage from, uh, to be taken advantage of from any location. It doesn't need actual access. The concern of Hertzbleed is that even though it is currently affecting previous and current AMD and Intel processors, it could potentially affect cutting edge CPUs. This concern is because it works by noticing the power calculations behind the dynamic voltage frequency scaling, or DVFS method, which is a standard found in present day CPUs. Any processor with dynamic power and proper cooling management can be affected. So also you could just get rid of your cooling and run that thing to the, into the dirt. <laughs> That's a joke. Don't do that. Intel says that, that says this has provoked it to impart its discoveries to other chip makers so they can evaluate any expected effect. Intel says that it doesn't think this assault is pragmatic beyond a lab since it takes hours to days to find and remove crypt a cryptographic key. Furthermore, an assault like this would require high tech and resolution monitoring capacities. Intel's current mitigation technique incorporates programming fixes for any code helpless to empower a power side channel assault. However, the organization isn't sending firmware fixes. AMD is likewise not giving a microcode fix. Nonetheless, some moderation procedures influence CPU performance. This impact changes by processor design and whether the fix can achieve it in the hardware programming or a blend of both. Hertzbleed has been applied to the Intel SA00698ID and CVE2022244436 ID Intel and the AMD CVE2022-23823. Depending on the situation, users can stop the assault by handicapping Intel's Turbo Boost or AMD's Precision Boost. Called it. I called it. I had a feeling you could do that. So you get rid of PBO or you turn off turbo boost. If you want the additional performance of the higher clocks, you basically go in and hard set your voltage and of course your overclock. Make sure that when you do that, you have the proper cooling to accommodate. Uh, this is something I'll be doing on any PCs that hold any cryptographic information personally. So um, I'd recommend you do the same. Now, the likelihood of you being targeted by this when there's a ton of higher, I guess, uh, higher level economic attacks that could be played out here is pretty low. But to protect yourself, this is one way to go ahead and do it, right? Get rid of precision boost, get rid of turbo boost, hard set your uh, overclocks and your voltages, and that should take care of it. The Hertz Bleed report comes amid a more extensive Intel release today that incorporates three security warnings spanning over six weaknesses, which the company has located through its interior examination. Intel has patched up its inward security examination mechanical assembly directly following the Spectre and meltdown weaknesses, reinforcing its endeavors to find flaws in its chips before the security shortcomings are found in nature. The current warning incorporates the MMIO stale data advisory weakness record re or recorded as Intel SA00615. This weakness requires firmware, hypervisor, and operating system updates to amend the component weakness thoroughly. So if you are in IT and you deal with virtualization, well, welcome to hell week because I apologize, but you're going to be updating firmware and hypervisors and all that fun stuff again, just like you did with Meltdown and Spectre. And I was around doing that in the virtualization scene during Spectre and Meltdown. So don't worry. I know what you're going to go through. Apologies. I hope you have a good week. Hopefully you can watch this channel in the background while you're patching everything up. <laughs> Intel has distributed a concise outline in Specialized Profound Plunge. At last, the MMIO un, un, uh, Undefined Access Advisory covers a hypervisor weakness, Intel SA00645. Intel has posted directions for moderating this weakness. So there's the security update, and we have more processor flaws. If you are a home PC user, obviously your best bet here is going to be going ahead and locking down that core to a specific speed, whether that be like depending on your processor, 4.5 to 5 gigahertz, depending somewhere around that range, and locking down that core voltage, turning off turbo boost, and then calling it a day. 
Now you could just turn off turbo boost, but you're going to be giving up performance. So you probably want to overclock a little bit. Uh, that will be dependent, of course, on your cooling and all of that, because once you overclock and hard set that, your processor is going to run at that speed 24-7. It probably also means that you're going to be seeing a bigger, I would assume, a bigger performance hit on Intel side of things, at least for the 12 series versus AMD side of things, because you aren't going to be able to really easily... Uh, what I found is the overclocking for the performance or the, sorry, the, the non-performance cores on the Intel 12 series can be a little tricky. So I hope you enjoyed this clip from the crypto mining morning show every Monday through Friday, 7:45 AM Pacific and 10 45 AM Eastern time. You can check out more clips here, or if you're interested in checking out the entire live show, you can check that out down here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Tuesday.